Welcome to Equipping Leaders, a podcast where I share and discuss resources, tools, and information to equip leaders to build creative, cohesive teams through culture and leader development. Welcome to the Equipping Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Natasha, and today I am sharing a conversation that I had with strengths coach Valerie Rivera on Clifton Strengths, Culture Catalysts, and Books. As leaders, there are a lot of assessments and tools that are available for use, and understanding which ones provide us the value that we need for our teams will allow us to use them more intentionally. We will jump in and get started. So if I could have you uh, start by introducing yourself and what your style of coaching or people development is. Ooh, so hi everyone. My name is Val Rivera. And I think if I had to describe myself as a coach, first and foremost, it's centered on strengths. So I'll get more into Gallup strengths coach stuff and all that goodness. But I also have a flavor of CTI coaching behind me too. And that comes from a class I took at Stanford while I was there in business school, which is about leading with coaching. It was my first experience to really practice some of those techniques. But one of the things I loved about it was just jumping into working with people, thinking of them as being creative, resourceful, and whole. And for me, this was like such a game shifter, especially coming out of many, many years in the military where it's like, what's your defect? Let's fix you. And these ideas of mentorship being like, clearly I'm successful. Don't you want to be like me? Here's my path. Here's what I did. Follow that path to success. And I never really felt like I was on anybody's path other than my own. And so I approached coaching with this flair of you are unique, you are special, you have strengths. Let's figure those out and help you practice what it takes, making sure you get in the spots where you can really shine because I really think this world has space for all of us to be the best version of ourselves. I love that. And I really appreciate too that piece of people are already whole, like no one is defective or needs to be mended by anyone else. and. How do we bring that out? And with the strengths piece too, I think there's a lot of where do you fit? Because that's where you're gonna shine and you're gonna be the best contributor to an organization. Oh yeah, you know, and I think a lot of this, I'll tell you, I first did my Clifton Strengths back in, I think it was like 2012. I was in an Air Force professional military education experience and getting my results back and seeing four pages of description of how I shined was so eye-opening because by that time I'd had 10 years in this career and what I felt more often than not was you don't quite fit. Like there's like these areas of friction where the way you behave, the way you lean into things isn't typical military. And that for me unlocked this path to understanding that Yeah, that's true. Like maybe I don't fit, but here's what I add that you actually need. You need some of this. And so I started switching my mindset from being like, how do I adapt to the organization and kind of like blend into other people to saying like, how do I take what I have and understand who I am and how that adds value to the organization? And that was a big shift for me. And then it just became part of how I dealt with everybody that crossed my path within the Air Force. And then, you know, externally working with clients now at Take Back Work. So really interesting to see how that that happens. And I think it's, you know, when you're young, you don't even really know who you are. I mean, maybe some people are blessed with that, but I find that if you don't really make time and space for it, it will eventually happen, but it can happen a lot faster with tools like that. Absolutely. I have found that there are these places where I was, I think I need to be there, which is just a lack of professional maturity sometimes. And then you get there and people are like, it's not working, right? Like you don't fit. And you're like, I will change. I will mold into this other thing. And you do just kind of find that while you may be able to mold or adapt, you're not really fulfilled, even though other things may be happening that people like deem as successful. But there's this piece where you're like, no matter how hard you work, you still kind of feel like you're not giving enough, like you're not doing enough because you know, like your subconscious is like, oh, you got all this other stuff you can do over here. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, and, and just a quick aside, I, but I remember working with this guy, Ed, and he was a wonderful person, but one of the things he shared with me was like, there's Ed, the master chief, and then there's Ed at home. And like having that sense of being, having to be two separate people at work and at home, it just kind of made me sad, right? Like does it have to be that way? And I heard this from so many other people, but I started questioning whether that needed to be true. And then, you know, there's all this stuff in the, the research about being more of an authentic leader, but like, what does that even mean too? And so for me, it just became, can you be the same at home as you are at work? And if so, like, what's that, what's that special spot that allows you to be successful in both of those domains? Yes, I've, I've talked to many people also in the military who some of them have said, yeah, when I put on this uniform, it is the greatest role I've ever played in my life. Like I do become this other person that may or may not be authentically who I am or maybe not at all who I am. Yeah, and I mean, I get it. It's like, it's hard. Sometimes you have to show up in different ways and, and that, that rings true for the corporate world too, like being strong when you really feel weak or, or other things. But to the, to the, I guess to the point where it doesn't have to be 100% of the time that you're showing up not as who you are or how you're feeling, that's what I'm really getting after. And you had said that you had first done the Clifton Strengths in 2012 and that changed how you showed up. But then have you had an opportunity to take it again? And did you notice any of your shifts kind of, or any of your strengths kind of realigning now that you've kind of stepped into those strengths? Ooh, that is a great question. And I tell you what, Natasha, I did not retake it. I kind of liked mine and I didn't want them to change. No <laughs> lie there. But what I did do is that since I took it in 2012, they've expanded it so that you can actually tap into all of your 34. Like you can see one through 34, how they're aligned down the road. So like, I don't know, should we give a little recap of what Clifton strengths are? Are people like- absolutely. Is Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so Clifton Strengths basically was started by Don Clifton. He was a psychologist, and one of his frustrations was that, you know, in that field, they were spending most of their time cataloging what's wrong with people, what makes people broken, to get to like what we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation. And so he started asking the question of what happens if we look at what makes people excel? What makes them exceptional? What then? And so they started doing a bunch of research on that. And over time, they refined it and they broke it down to these 34 themes, which they call talents. And then these talents, if they're effectively practiced and applied, can become strengths. But the idea is that within each of us, we have all of these strengths resident, but some rise to the top. And your top five strengths are the ones that they say that you should work on really honing and being able to use them. And also understanding, of course, like the downside of overuse, but like these are the ones that you should be focused on. And then, you know, your top 10 are where you probably spend the majority of your time. But what I love about it is that they also break these 34 themes down into four different domains. So there's the execution domain, like the getting stuff done kind of piece, their strategic thinking, which is where I spend a lot of my top five themes are in there. And then there's relationship building and influencing. And so um, the really cool thing though too, is that it really gives people a unique blueprint of who you are. And for any person to have the same top five in the same order as somebody else, it's like a one in 33 million chance. So I just think that's so wild. I love seeing all my top 34, like, or not top 34, but numbered one through 34 to see what happens. There were, no, there were some things that were surprising, some things that were not, but it, all, it always like brings up a great conversation. If you're having that with a loved one, a spouse, significant other, teammate, boss, whatever, it just becomes such a fertile ground for conversation about who you are and how you want to grow. Yes, and I have found that when you look at, at the higher numbers, not your top five, but when you get kind of further down the list, because I take it every couple of years just to see how I've adjusted. And I tend to actually fall within the same like domains, like the same big four. But when I look at other ones, I'm like, oh no, I think I'm like that. 
But to really learn about it and say, oh no, I really respect that quality in others. And that's why it's like, I have such respect for it that I realize that I don't have it. And so I notice other people have it. And I'm like, oh, how do I get more of that? Yeah, that's so, that's so true. It's, it's easy to really see these things and just want a little piece of them in yourself. And then the question becomes, well, how do I use more of what I have to get some of the same outcomes that people with that strength bring about? What other frameworks do you commonly use in your work? Oh man, so great questions abounding everywhere. I will tell you that for Clifton Strengths, especially, I love it's so simple, but the main idea is you have these strengths. Let's name them, let's claim them, and let's aim them. And that basically comes down to can you really understand what these strengths are? Like, in your own words, how do you describe them? Like one of my top five is woo. And at first I was like, woo, what is that? You know, but it's basically winning others over and getting a sense of like, oh yeah, you know, I understand what that means. I really want to connect with people and understand what makes them special because down the road, I love to connect people together and see what magic happens when their paths cross, right? So I name it and then I claim it and see those stories of how that strength shows up in my life. And then I aim it towards different scenarios or situations that I have. And I found this framework to be really effective for clients because it's just so actionable. And I think that is where sometimes things feel a little esoteric, right? It's like, okay, that's cool. I learned something about myself, but how do I apply? It? Like, how do I close that knowing doing gap? And so that's why that's one of my like favorite frameworks of the coaching sphere. And I love that because it's actionable in each of the phases in the naming, claiming, and aiming. And I think it, you know, it works for not just things that are strengths related too, right? It's, it could be a lesson that you learned or something else. I think deep down as humans, when we're taking in new information, we do need to personalize it in some way, shape, or form. And we do have to actively look for some way to use it immediately. Yeah right? Or else it just like kind of dissipates and flows away. Yes. Whenever I facilitate a class or when I leave a, a session with a coaching client, I always want there to be something that they can do with that information or with that session within the next 48 to 72 hours. Because otherwise you're right, it's gone. And it's just this great idea that we talked about. And that's fine, but it's not ultimately moving anyone forward. Right. And that's what coaching is all supposed to be about. How can team culture be shaped by using this strength based methodology? That is a great question, too, because I mean, like ultimately strengths, what's powerful about it is there's like components that happen at the individual level, like knowing yourself better and how you show up as an integral member of a team. But then collectively on a team, you can really do some special stuff with that. In fact, we're working with our team at Take Back Work where every person that we onboard gets a chance to take the Clifton Strengths and we get a chance to see where each other shows up. And so we still have to do a better job of this. Like anything, it takes practice, it takes deliberate effort. But what we're finding is that first and foremost, having everyone take it allows us to have a shared vocabulary. Whether it's like some other topic you're talking about, I cannot say enough about the power of shared vocabulary on a team. And so when we can like throw out these different domains or understand that somebody's achiever strength is being activated based on stuff that we've got going on, we can like laugh about that, chuckle about it, celebrate it in each other. And then, you know, especially as we're looking to work on different projects, we could say, how might we put together a team that has all the kinds of strengths that we need and the different domains we need them in to be successful. Because I don't know about you, but I've worked on teams where we've discovered that we are all strategic thinkers and there's no execution in any of our top five. And we're like, wow, that explains a few things. It wasn't that we weren't successful, right? Because we did, we can execute, we can get stuff done, but it is harder. And when we added somebody new to the team with the strengths and execution domain, 
boom. It just felt like a lot of that resistance went away because now they're operating in their strengths and moving us along. So um, on that team level, it's just amazing what happens when you get the combinations right, when you're really um, thinking through that. And again, you don't have to do strengths to know what people are good at. You can ask them simply like, what's the work you really gravitate to? What gets you excited? What do you want to do more of? And then consequently, what do you want to do less of? And you can figure that out as a manager. It's just, you can go a lot faster, a lot further when you have a framework or a system like that, that allows you to get that vocabulary going. I've definitely seen that too in both my personal experience and then just in watching different teams as they're trying to come together. And I remember just kind of working with this one team where they just all really loved to just admire a problem and talk about the problem. But then on the other end, it was like, okay, so maybe we solve that problem. And they're like, oh, but look at how beautiful this problem is, right? So it, it was complicated. Whether it's with an individual or on a team, when someone is working in their strengths, what does strengths look like when they come under stress? Yeah, so how does it show up under stress? You know, it's a great question. And, and one thing that I keep coming back to is some of the amazing research that Gallup has done that shows that when people are working in their strength zones, they're more motivated at work. They are more creative. They are more satisfied. It's just, it leads to greater productivity and all of these things. And, you know, while I don't have the empirical data to support like the answer that I'm having right here, I'm just like gonna step from my heart and say that what I've experienced when you're working in your strengths and you're under the gun is that it feels more like a puzzle to solve. It's a challenge worth rising to and you're ready to use your strengths for that it's still difficult, it's still really challenging, it's still really stressful, but you don't feel ill-equipped. You know, like you don't have that hopeless sense of like, oh, like Sisyphus, like I'll never be able to accomplish what's in front of me right now. I feel the same way about myself as an individual, looking at individual tasks as I do at team tasks. Like there are some things that we have that we're working on in the company where hey, if we didn't have these requisite talents on the team to tap into, I might be more nervous. Like I might be more stressed out, but in fact, I'm going like, wow, we've got what it takes to do this. And, and it's, it's going to be tough, but we'll get it done. So there's like a level of confidence and more leaning into the challenge vice feeling demoralized by it. I think it was Stephanie Johnson in her book, Inclusify. She was talking about how sometimes people get so caught up in like, are they a good like culture fit? Meaning, do they think like me? Do they act like me? That it actually is, it's not good for diversity in general. But I think also sometimes people are like, we get along, this is great. We're gonna be able to do this, let's start a business. And then they kind of get into it and like I said, they realize that, oh, we're all kind of thinking this way. Why isn't this moving forward? But yeah, to be able to have that confidence in the team, because you know that the team together, you know, is greater than the sum of its parts. Oh, so true, so true. And I'm really glad you're bringing up that piece about culture fit, because we do a lot with culture at Take Back Work. And I think that's one of the biggest pitfalls. It's kind of like thinking that you need to pick somebody that looks like you, thinks like you, has the same interests as you do. That's a recipe for homogeneity and just disaster, right? Like you can go faster with a team like that, but when, you know, stuff really hits the fan, it's gonna be harder. And so that's why when we're working with clients, we're really aiming for them to have either a values fit or what my friend Rachel would call like a truth fit. Right? Sometimes values feel like, oh, that's the posters on the wall, but what are the truths that we believe as a company that drive our behaviors? And what I love about that is if you can share those same truths, all of that other stuff can be different. But at that core ideology piece, you are aligned, right? So there's like more space for thinking differently, for behaving differently, but underlying that is something that's it's really solid. Yes, and I've seen too with some teams where if they have like, if they're very uh, 
strong in like the judger judgment area, which is a great area because really it just means that you want there to be things to be resolved, there to be a conclusion, you want it to keep moving forward. But then, yeah, when they're under stress and they don't have anybody else to balance that out and they don't have confidence in their team, how all of a sudden that becomes micromanagement and this need for control over too many things and they can't back off because they don't trust the team. Oh yeah. Man, I'm getting like the shivers from that. It's like bringing back a lot of memories of, you know, I mean, we have that shared military background, but you know, there would be like a deadline for something. And then depending on who your manager was, that deadline would arbitrarily get moved up by like a month or something ridiculous. And it's just like, wow, <laughs> why yes. does it have to be this way? <laughs> It doesn't, right? That's just it. And, and yeah, I think also when people don't have the opportunity or take the opportunity, depending on the person, to really learn these other frameworks, learn these other ways of being in the workplace. And they, they're just kind of like, army regulations are fine, right? There's the leadership regulation, all this sort of stuff. And that's fine. And on paper, it's perfect. But then you have people implementing it. And of course, people are not perfect. And that's what makes people great. But they don't start to look out of being like, well, we don't just do this because that's what the Army said. How do we do this in a way that actually is helping people stay motivated instead of just being like, oh, you signed up for this. You're a patriot. You're in the, you know, or, or kind of whatever crazy things we've heard along the way. But really to find those tools and then bring them into the workplace. And I think that's something that some places just lack. Oh, so true. <laughs> Speaking the truth right there, Natasha. <laughs> so we kind of have already touched on this, but I'll just ask the question more directly too. So when you do allow people to work in their strengths, and let's say an organization has not done that before, but then they just kind of start to do that and they kind of try it out. What does that kind of look like at first with the challenges that they initially face, especially when something goes wrong? But then how does that ultimately benefit the organization as a whole? Well, I think first and foremost, sometimes the way work is structured will need to change. And anytime something changes, that's where we tend to see this friction emerge, right? Because like most change has been painful. Like if you think back to the initiatives you've been part of or experienced, most of the time there was a lack of communication or somebody didn't think about the second and third order effects of something changing. And so this is where I think it's, it's really good to go slow to go fast, especially as a manager. Um, one of the things I did as a mission manager back in the day, I had like 19 people working for me and we, you know, we inherited our mission the way it was. We had certain ways of doing things and all that good stuff. But I just wanted to take an incremental approach. And what I did was I just had that conversation with each person on the team, kind of like what I described. What do you enjoy working on here? You know, is there certain stuff you'd like to do more of? And what would you like to do less of? And I basically just gathered all of that data and information I started looking at it and thinking about it as a manager and thinking about everything we had to tackle each day and then wondering and asking myself, are there different ways where I can help this person get more experience of this or more experience of that? So I didn't change everything all at once. I just like found little incremental things to test out and see what would happen. So like, for example, one person um, loved working with an imagery analyst. You know, we were in the Intel world and anytime an opportunity came up to work with that person, I would try and put them together because I knew he was just like hungry for that. And as a result, over time, people's confidence grew. We saw major outcomes in terms of like productivity for folks. Like they're just enjoying and finding themselves more and more often in the flow. And then it became easier to pinpoint, like it's, it's like such a paradox that sometimes you don't know your people well when they're not in their strength zone. They're just kind of like going through the motions, right? And then as you start tweaking things just a little bit, you start seeing them as like these little shiny things like, oh, this is my rock star of this. This is like my go-to for that. And then everything becomes easier. And one of the analogies I use is it's kind of like having a toolbox 
right? If you don't do anything to differentiate that, you could think that you just have a toolbox full of hammers. People are just going through, doing the checklist, yada, yada, yada. They're all interchangeable. And that is absolutely not the case. But unless you're doing the work to identify their strengths and help them see their strengths, you're not gonna know that. And then once you do that work, you can look into this toolbox and see each person differentiated and know who to apply to what challenge. And then it becomes like really fun because you're like, yeah, hand me the wrench, hand me the level, hand me the ruler, whatever it is that you need. And when they start seeing that too, it becomes a different form of shorthand. So sometimes I would even just ask them, think about your natural problem solving, like how you gravitate, like how do you solve problems? And then tell me what tool you would be like, what would your superpower be? And that can be really eye-opening too. So just throwing that out there. I love that because I think also people will also trust change more than when it occurs. And they don't just think it's random and they're just being thrown at a problem for kind of no reason. But that like process of getting to know people, kind of figuring out where their strengths lie so that then in the future, when you ask them to do something that you know is outside of their strengths, you can acknowledge that, but you can also acknowledge that we've done hard things before. But it's so true though, and people, they need these like little steps to kind of show them, to be able to point to, to be like, we've been successful before, and this change is different, but that change was different too. So we can do this together. So I really, I love that perspective. Oh, and I'll also just add that it's interesting because when they start working in their strengths, they start driving the change. It becomes less me driving the change and more them seeing the opportunities for things to get better. And it becomes more of like, you know, it, it, that I, I intend to leadership style that David Marquet talks about. Like they're starting to bring you the ideas and say, hey, I think we should do this. And I'm like, yeah, sounds amazing. Go ahead, do that. And yeah, being part of a team, I think also when you can kind of get rid of that hierarchy, there are people who are responsible for different things, of course. But yeah, when you can kind of flatten a hierarchy and let each person be a contributing member, regardless of where they are in this hierarchy, I think that really also, it makes people want to show up more. We were connected by a mutual friend and uh, it was actually for your Culture Catalyst book club, which I love. But before we jump into how amazing the book club is, what is a culture catalyst and how did it evolve in your work? Oh man, such a great question. And you know, first of all, I love the alliteration, culture <laughs> catalyst, it's just fun to say. But you know, it kind of comes from my own experience being within a large bureaucracy. And I started noticing that there were people like myself and others who tended to have like a larger sway over like, just the vibe of the place, right? So in my mind, a culture catalyst is a person who has a unique and interesting influence on an organization that helps them live and aspire to bigger and better things culturally. So um, sometimes it shows up like, you know, from a Malcolm Gladwell perspective of, of being like the, the mavens and the salesmen and the connectors of an organization, you know, the people sparking different things and bringing other people on board. And they just generally have an outsized influence. So it doesn't matter if they're at the top, the bottom or somewhere in the middle, they're the people that other people are looking to for clues about what it means to be part of this organization. And I really appreciate that perspective of a lot of people think the thought leader, this, the change agent or whoever is typically higher in an organization. But really, we've all seen those people who something will be said and they look at someone who's kind of more junior and you're like, oh, that person is kind of helping to drive this or drive whatever. So I think that's such an important distinction where being a culture catalyst is for everyone. Like you can drive that positive change, make your organization better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'll also say that sometimes it's like, of course, different strokes for different folks, but like people find this research, they find different books, they find different pieces of information that they start wondering, how do they put into practice within their own team, within their own sphere of influence? And 
Like that's where a lot of the change, change happens within large, especially like bureaucracies. It happens at the team level, right? I always look at teams as like, if you like, don't worry about changing the whole organization. Yeah, that's cool if you want to think that way too, but how powerful would it be for, you know, to just have that one person on the team that's really thinking about this stuff and sparking that that um, it's almost like a rebirth within the team because then you see all this amazing stuff happening. And I tell you what, the other teams stand up and take notice, like what's going on there? And at first they're gonna think you have more people or better people or more money or more whatever, but it's really about the choices that are made by the leaders and the, the other folks on the team about how they wanna behave and interact in and, and ways that are often more positive, more generative, just like, more aspirational and a lot of times people think i want to change something i want to change and it's always something huge i'm gonna change this company i'm gonna change the world i'm gonna change this whole thing but i know john maxwell he says you know a mass movement doesn't start with a mass it starts with one person who says an idea to somebody else or shows up differently and behaves in a new way with one other person and that's then it gets that snowball effect if it's right so I think that, yeah, to really not think about it so huge, just share it with who's around you. Also find those people who, when I say like-minded, like-minded in the sense that they're open to change, they're open to new things and can have that conversation back and forth with you. And then also empowering other people who maybe hadn't thought about it like that before, but finding a way to give them a voice in that as well. Ooh, so powerful right there. And yeah, I really do that believe that change happens down at the conversational level. Like that's why I think it's so powerful to think about the questions that we're asking, the words we're using, you know, it's still a practice in terms of like things I'm working on, but the more I dig into this, this uh, concept of appreciative inquiry, the more I'm realizing that there's a lot of truth there. I'm still trying to master that, but there's goodness and it resonates with everything that you're talking about with John Maxwell too. So what inspires you about your work, either with take back work or your work as a coach? You know, they, they're really interwoven with each other. Like coaching is just like a part of how we address like working with our clients and their challenges. But, you know, originally when I started the company, it was from that experience I had while I was in the Air Force where we really started working on workplace culture in very tangible ways. And what it became was this platform that invited people to think differently about their role, their work. And it sounds like, I don't know, like I think people struggle to see how this could really be profound, but I saw people come back to life at work. People who had been written off, people that nobody wanted, that were like cast aside. And when we thought differently about how to structure the work, how to invite them in, how to make sure they had that sense of purpose and mastery and autonomy that Dan Pink talks about, when we did that, we saw such a profound shift and made me think like, gosh, you know, most of us are gonna spend a good portion of our lives at work. Like, why don't we create these workplaces where people thrive? Because it is good for them and it's good for the company or the organization, whatever it is. And like, it just felt really good to do that. And so the question became, how do I start a company so I can do this forever? And that's where Take Back Work comes in. And now we're working with bold, ambitious leaders who want to see that kind of transformation within their teams. And they just need help putting it into practice, supporting them as they go through the, through the wickets of it. And it is a journey. It's sometimes hard, a lot of times really exciting. But what we've discovered is that we end up coaching on all these different levels, right? Whether you're in conversation with those C-level executives or whether you're working with different members of the team, it's about crafting something that's integrated, something that has many touch points for different people in an organization to choose to be part of it at different times. And that's why we're putting on summits now where people can get to know each other and get inspired. We're doing deep dive workshops on different topics where folks can like really get their hands into the research and how it aligns with their lives. And then also like bringing in opportunities for them to practice through cohort-based initiatives where they're working on real issues 
for their companies and organizations, but along the way, they're learning about psychological safety, appreciative inquiry, intrinsic motivation. And it's not like, let's learn about this topic. No, it's like, we're gonna bake this in because you have big goals that you're working on and you'll just, we'll pull back the curtain every once in a while and let you know what just happened here so that you understand this when you're working on this with your own teens. Like it's not psychological safety for psychological safety's sake. Mm -hmm. Like that's not how anything takes root. It's in the service of a larger goal. And I just wanna put that out there because sometimes people do feel like, oh, I just wanna get a workshop on that and like check the box. Yes. It will help, like you're gonna get a boost, you're gonna get a few things, but if you really wanna commit to it, it takes that more integrated um, mindset to really get it done. And often whenever I introduce like a new program or I say, you know, hey, here's what I think would be beneficial and here's how long it's gonna take. Here is the business case for why this would work and why it needs to be this long and have this many touch points throughout however much time. And I think sometimes, because sometimes people are so driven by what's quantifiable, if you can pull in those business cases or make a business case for what, how it aligns with what someone's doing and give them that quantifiable thing, then it also kind of sets their mind up for Okay, so this, we're not just going to travel along this road, check these boxes along the way. It's this process. And I think that helps people get a little more comfortable with something that they may not be comfortable with. What is the Culture Catalyst Book Club and how can people join it? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I think it's probably pretty clear from the things that I've sh shared that books have been a big part of my journey. And it took me a while to start reading them. And I just remember thinking like, wow, like more people should be reading these books. Like there's so much that we could do. So one of the things we did three years ago at Take Back Work was we just said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if over the course of the year, we picked out 12 different books, one book for each month, and we started reading that collectively with this eye that the book should be related to this culture catalyst movement. So there's a little bit of leadership, there's a little bit of skill development and self-work in there. There's things that happen at the individual team and organizational level. So we try and pick the books in a way that it's it's really going to support this culture catalyst on their journey. Um, and what I love about it is that it's completely free. It's get the books however you like. So we have people going to the library, we have people listening to audiobooks, and folks are getting them on Amazon or wherever. And then people share in discussion questions on our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. I will tell you that the Facebook is way more juicy. So if you're so inclined, hop in over there. But if you wanna start lighting up the LinkedIn one, awesome and i'll share a link with you we just have a, a quick just a little form i think first name and email address but i'll drop that over to you and we would love to have people join whenever you don't have to wait for january you just pop in there you'll get a downloadable pdf with all the books for a year and then it's not all the books it's the list of books with insights about each one of them and a few discussion questions and then each month we do a recap email as well as like a, a forward leaning overview of the book to come so that's it in a nutshell and you know every time i think oh should we keep doing this is this something that needs to be done anymore is it like played out i get a note from somebody that just says oh my gosh this has changed my life or you know people are coming to me for recommendations or i found my path finally and it just makes you realize over and over again how powerful it is to be a reader and leaders are readers and readers are leaders so that's how i feel about that I love the I love the book club and I always love the books that you guys have selected. They really are like impactful, like you said, on that personal and organizational level. They're current books that actually are like, what does the workplace look like right now? Reading not only gives you these other ideas for how you could show up in anything, but I think it also really deepens your empathy. It deepens these other things where you're like, I don't have all these experiences and it's impossible to have every experience but i can gain some perspective some wisdom from what other people have gone through and i will say that you are like one of the most prolific readers i've ever come across so i love it i'm always like what's natasha reading <laughs> well, thank you <laughs>
it's a big, yeah, it's a big part of who I am. So, and not to get too nerdy about it, but reading also, they say that if you just read for about five minutes, I think it was the University of Minnesota did this study, reading for just five minutes will actually decrease your stress by 68%. What? So if you're in the middle of something, yeah. But yeah, so whenever I feel like I'm like overly stressed about something, I don't need an hour to read. I can just take a few minutes and you just read and move on to the next thing. Powerful. That is probably going into book club. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you like to promote and where can people find you and learn more about you and your work? Mm. So friends out there, if this is like, getting you excited, I would invite you to just hop on over to takebackwork.com. We do have a free grassroots guide over there. If you just pop in your email address name, you'll start getting a few emails from us and it just tells you the story of how we got started. And there's a lot of good nuggets in there. But I think what's more exciting than just that is that you'll get on the list for some of the emails that we have that share the events we have coming up. Because what we're really passionate about is growing that culture catalyst community. So we try and do these 90 minute free sessions about once a month, really fun for people to hop into. Follow us on all the interwebs at Take Back Work and on Clubhouse, just my name at Valerie Rivera. In this episode, Valerie and I touched on a lot of topics, including strengths, strengths under stress, and my favorite topic, books. To explore these concepts more for your own self-development, I would invite you to journal about a few questions and a quote. The first question is, in what ways can you be a culture catalyst in your organization? And second, if you have taken the Clifton Strengths Assessment, how do you see yourself using your top five strengths in your workplace? If you have not taken the Clifton Strengths Assessment, which of the 34 strengths do you think would be in your top five and why? The quote I have for you is from Simon Sinek, who said, leadership isn't about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. Thank you for listening to this episode of Equipping Leaders. All of the resources mentioned in this episode can be found on my website, natashacheyenne.com, as well as timestamps to help you get right to the resource that you are looking for. On the website, you can also find a weekly leadership journal entry, a resource page with challenges and downloadable content, a place to sign up for my weekly newsletter, and an upcoming leadership platform full of workshops. You can also follow me on Instagram at novel underscore Natasha and on Twitter and Facebook at Natasha Cheyenne. If you'd like to hear more about a specific topic, please reach out and let me know. Join me next week for another episode.